Hi everyone, thank you for being here. Um, and thank you, uh, Vladimir. I'm delighted to uh, be your guinea pig for uh, your second event here. So, my name is Bartosz. Um, as you could maybe guess, I'm uh, Franco Polish. Uh, and indeed, I'm working for uh, XG Ventures. Uh, it's been a year now, a bit over a year now. So, you might be wondering what is XG Ventures and why we are here. So, XG Ventures, as the name suggests, is a venture capital fund. Uh, we're based in uh, Stockholm, London, Amsterdam, soon to be Paris, uh, and San Francisco, and Berlin as well, forgot this one. Uh, Pan-European Venture Fund created uh, roughly three years ago. Uh, actually, one of the three co-founders is here today, Lars, he'll be speaking in a few minutes. And the idea behind our creation is basically this. So, Europe is a fantastic land of opportunities, Tons of unicorns, uh, not so many in France as you can see, but still, uh, we're based up there in uh, Sweden. But the problem is, it's very easy to find early stage capital in Europe. You know, seed, series A, you get tons of these in Europe. But then as you're trying to scale on a European or worldwide scale, then you have to basically turn uh, to these guys. They're all based in the US, great investors, uh, lots of money able to follow you from seed to IPO, a multi-billion dollar valuation, uh, operational support, but they're based in the US. So what we try to do is basically bring this model to Europe. And the way we do it is first, we raise a fairly big fund for Europe, uh, close to 600 million euros, that enables us to really support the companies from a funding perspective, from usually s Series A up until the IPO, so let's say sweet spot on series A, B, sometimes seed, sometimes series C, but usually series A and B. And the second thing is our operating support, uh, which, uh, which embodiment is a team of operating partners. So we are a fairly big team for a venture fund, 24 people, uh, based in different cities in Europe, and seven of them are what we call operational partners focused on post-investment help for for you guys for portfolio companies on each specialized on one area of expertise ranging from HR to uh, UX and design product international development marketing and comms um, admin and finance and so on so this is uh, this is us uh, half startup half VC uh, all the team members are ex operators from startup I'm actually the only one uh, who, who is not a former operator. Um, and we back companies from the startup stage up until the growth stage. Uh, so I guess most of you guys here are rather in the startup space, maybe with the scale up one. And we have a multi-stage approach and we can help you at any stage of your development. So we invest, we our mandate is fairly broad. So from 1 million to 75 million on paper, then our sweet spot is really from say 5 million to 20 million uh, euros for a first ticket. And then, as I said, we follow all the rounds. We have um, a few exceptions, earliest, earlier stage deals. And we're uh, especially looking for earlier stage deals in uh, consumer because we have a very strong consumer DNA with founders coming from King, like Lars, coming from Booking, coming from Spotify, coming from um, Hotel Tonight and other companies like this. And we really want to help consumer companies especially here in Paris. So this is our portfolio. We did 28 uh, investments now. Uh, seven of them are B2C companies. We are looking forward to have more of them. Um, and this is our portfolio in Paris. So we started our operations in Paris roughly a year ago. We did two investments there, uh, as maybe you know these companies, uh, Coldesk and Tiny Clues. Both of them are selling software to big enterprise customers, so not exactly consumer. And this is what we're trying to uh, to diversify with more consumer companies. So this is us, um, and tonight you're going to hear from Angus Lovett and uh, Lars Yornov, both from King, uh, respectively uh, VP Performance Marketing and VP Growth, or um, previously. And Lars is also the co-founder of XG Ventures. So um, um, I'm really glad that you guys are here, and I really hope that you'll have an amazing time. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Bartosz, and welcome, Angus. Uh, great to be here. Uh, sorry we're speaking English. I think both Angus and I, our French, uh, won't make sense to anyone here. Uh, but, but great to be here in Paris, and I'm going to start off by, by uh, you know, I think Bartosz made a great intro, but I think the background for this event here is, is twofold. One is that Equity Ventures really wants to go all in on Paris and France as a future uh, focus area for us. And the other one is that when we looked at comparing France with some of the other tech hubs across Europe, we noticed that there aren't that many uh, European-wide or global winners within consumer tech. And that's specifically what we'd like to uh, try to help with uh, to the extent that we can with capital and, and maybe some advice. Uh, and, and that's what we're talking about tonight. And, and then I, I thought it would be good to uh, bring Angus with me here. Hey, family. <laughs> right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce him. So, so as, as, as Bartosz mentioned, we are very active within B2C investments, uh, even not, so not as active as we would like to be. We'd like to do many more B2C investments in the coming years. And if you look at our portfolio so far, we've invested in, in small giant games, which we did together with Angus. We've done Natural Cycles, which is a female contraceptive app. We've done uh, Min Doctor, which is a, a digital primary care uh, company, uh, and a couple of others. And, and one of the things that I want to point out with these investments is that what we look for early when we go in is high engagement and high retention. So at the very core of building a successful uh, global consumer business, my personal belief is you need to have long-term retention among your core users. And that should be the core focus of, of the first phase. We'll get back to that soon. But Angus, uh, again, great to have you here. W we've known each other since 2011, when, when you joined King to, to uh, essentially kick off the marketing team there. Yep. At that point, King was a, a small Swedish company with like two people in London, uh, no other people in Europe. Uh, and you joined, and then uh, a couple years later, uh, things really took off. So, sure. tell is us it, about is it. Is this where I take all the credit? Steal, yes. all, steal all the credit for a exactly. billion dollar company? I can do that. Um, so, first setting the scene, uh, in 2010, King was a flash, ga uh, flash based gaming portal. It was a skill, it was a very different business model uh, to what you see or what you know today as the makers of, of Candy Crush. Um, so, uh, that company was at about a $50 million run rate, I think, at the time. Uh, but one of the one of the core issues that it was just treading water. The reason for that is uh, the business was founded in 2003, I believe, 2003. Um, and by that stage, uh, the I guess the the, the web-based portal that they'd made has been outmoded. If you looked at alternative forms of entertainment, uh, yeah, by 2010 you had. Uh, you had uh, people playing mobile games. You had people playing social games. And so well, I, I remember if I'm allowed to curse in here, I'm not sure. Is there any rules? No. We, we made this FBF list, which was the, uh, the fucked by Facebook <laughs> list. <laughs> and, and our company was on top of it. Because <laughs> people were moving from playing from king.com to playing games on Facebook instead. So. Yeah, ab absolutely. And so one of the things that that actually affected interestingly wasn't our retention, because our retention was pretty strong. The thing that actually affected most for, for, for our company was our ability to attract new users. So, you know, when we're putting campaigns out in the marketplace, they weren't getting the same level of response. Uh, but also the same, if you looked at the sort of the user journey funnel, we weren't able to get people to sign up. And the people that did sign up had a much lower value than the people which had joined uh, since 2003. So. The statistic um, that I like to, we did a bit of analysis after I joined, and the statistic was something like 90% of all the revenue that was being generated was being generated by users that joined prior to 2000 and, uh, 2005 or something, and it was now 2010. So, which brings us to the first in inflection point. I remember, you know, doing a presentation to the board and really ramming home at that point. Um, that there was no way that we could continue to grow the existing business model because, you know, literally just a, a bar graph going, this is what we can, uh, you know, this is what we need to pay to acquire users, this, and this is what we can afford to pay. There's literally, rather than spending this $10 million 
uh, marketing budget that you, you, you've given me, you should save this money and spend it on something else. And I think from that, from that point on is where they started to get serious with the experimentation, which Lars here was very much a part of with various projects. Yeah, so the first iteration, we just put uh, the King.com games on Facebook, and that didn't work at all. Yeah, exactly. So the, the funnel was not where it should be. People didn't see a reason why they would play uh, the King games on a different platform. So again, it comes back to retention and engagement, uh, I think. So, um, the st and so, ha so how did how did it actually change? So, so one of the experiments uh, was uh, you know the little game called Bubble Saga on the social side. Uh, it made effectively a uh, thirty cents per user lifetime value. Thirty cents, nothing, right? The thing is, is that we had a team in place that were experts in Facebook marketing, and we could acquire the users for twenty five cents. So there's your funnel. So we kept on funneling those users back in. All of a sudden, that game had uh, one million daily active users. When our core business, the skill platform, had about two hundred and fifty thousand DAO. So we're looking at one our side project, our experiment, which had you know ho very high levels of virality, very high levels of engagement, and our core business, which which affected the much smaller. So the thought process then was, how do we make more money out of those users? And then we're set. And then we. The next version was Bubble Witch Saga, which you, you worked on, I believe. You were the producer. Yeah, I producer, was the producer of that. Producer. Yeah. So, you know, and that was went 10x in terms of the monetization. 10x, a huge leap in terms of from one iteration of effectively the product to a next. All of a sudden, instead of 30 cents per user, I could afford $3 for, for each user that I acquired. Um, and, and from then on, on in, it was just a process of, you know, making sure and validating you know, that our assumptions and our, our models are right in terms of lifetime value and going all in. So I think we were the largest Facebook uh, uh, spenders on Facebook at the time. Um, and uh, You guys spent a million a day for a while, right? Well, let's see. You know, well, well, and then Candy Crush came out. And one of the things uh, with, with Candy Crush, it was, it was um, a much, because it was on mobile specifically, it was a di even, again, a different level of... Um, of retention and engagement because it was on the home screen um, because it had all the right hooks it was much more mature product at that point but particularly on the marketing side no one valued mobile inventory no one valued mobile marketing no one was selling anything effectively there was no free to play as we know it uh, today uh, in the gaming space on mobile so we just bought all the inventory at one at one stage we were spending something like 1.8 million dollars a day on mobile display alone and we're buying up something like 40 percent of the world's global supply of impressions uh, uh for uh for, for, for candy crush effectively but maybe we should do a quick poll raise your hand if you've ever seen a candy crush ad <laughs> somewhere uh, yeah that's how right <laughs> how many people have played candy crush not so many usually there are a lot more that play than admit having played in audiences, because we know that from a fact, because there are, I think, two and a half billion downloads by now. And, and uh, I've never had an audience say that 90% have played it, because uh, there's still some... Uh, Hold that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, so, and which brings to the, to the last, so what's the kind of special source that made that happen? Well, there was, there was obviously an innovative first-to-market product. There was no doubt about that. It was a hit game by, by any standard, but what really made us own the opportunity, I think, was a perfect alignment between the product team, the marketing team, and management in terms of what we needed to do to maximize the opportunity. There was a system in place. People knew on the product side what the levers that they needed to pull to increase their retention, to increase their levers of mon uh, monetization. And they knew in turn, if they did that, that I could afford to pay more money in terms for acquiring users. And I spent more money, and then the game got got bigger. And all management needed to do was buy into the system and support the system, and be pretty hands off in terms of, uh, you know, no knee jerk reactions or pulling the rug out at, at any point in time. But there was some luck involved too. That's oh yeah, absolutely. Ma yeah. Massive success. I, I can tell you an interesting story. So we had we had uh, pegged up to launch Candy Crush on iOS uh, exclusively with Apple on a Thursday because this was in 2012. Uh, featuring updates were done weekly on Thursdays. 
Apple had kind of promised us a feature. They never, they never give you the actual promise. But we, we had played up, we had, uh, did a large party. We rented out the bar in, in Stockholm. It was 9 p.m. Swedish time, so noon Californian time. And they were updating the, the featuring page and we were all ready to cheer. And then nothing, they, they picked another game. Uh, you know, this is such a, you know, we were all half drunk already. We we're going to celebrate our one million free installs from Apple. Uh, and then we got nothing. So th the morning after, uh, we just had a, a scrum stand up and we said, so instead of, instead of doing the two week exclusive Apple launch, which a lot of people did at that point, we essentially said, okay, screw you guys. And then we launched on Google Play Friday after lunch, right before the weekend. And that turned out to be and best. actually, one of the best one decisions of the best we made, decisions. but it wasn't our idea. I can't, I can't <laughs> t take the, but we, you know, it was more reaction you sh you do to it, someone I do. else's decision. But then over the weekend, what we saw is that the cross-platform virality of being on, on all the web, iOS, and Google Play at the same time created, uh, at least for King at that point, an unprecedented amount of free installs. So we went from nothing to number one on the charts uh, across the world over the weekend. Uh, and that wouldn't have happened if we had only launched with Apple and gotten the feature Thursday night. Anyway, side story. <laughs> L let's fast forward a bit. So, I mean, we could talk about King in the old days uh, forever, yeah, but, forever, but if yeah. uh, uh, it's probably not so interesting. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, so, so looking at today, uh, you've, uh, we've all, we both left the company. It's great, it's great fun building a massive company, but it's not, my experience, not as much fun being a part of a public company, which I think a lot of you guys probably sympathize with as well, uh, being entrepreneurs and, and toiling on your own startups. So I think uh, both Angus and I, we, we left uh, quite, uh, I, I left one year after the IPO. You left uh, uh, two years? Yeah, two years. Y you lasted a bit longer. Yeah. And since then, you've been uh, angel investing a bit and, and uh, also advising a bit on, on marketing for startups. And do, doing a bit of consulting. So, um, you know, I don't want to focus too heavily on, on the gaming space because obviously we've got a very gaming, gaming heavy, heavy background. Um, effectively, what, uh, what I do is try to seek out companies that I can actually help uh, scale with paid marketing, okay? Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of people come to me and they say, okay, Angus, you know, you've done all this good stuff with, with King and, you know, with the media agency. Uh, can you help us with our Google campaign? Can you help us with our Facebook campaign? And, you know, my first response to them was that's, that's really the wrong that's the wrong question, because you've already framed the question in terms of you know the channels of which you're you're going to deliver, and you've you've basically bypassed about seven steps in, in the process. So uh, what I try to do is seek out a bit like Lars companies with you know really uh, you know effective rates of of, of um, retention and monetization uh, and high margins, so I can reinvest that revenue back into, into their marketing budget to help them scale with a real focus on ROI, right? I have models in place, make sure so we don't spend money unless there is a 99% probability that that money is gonna come back within a set pr time frame. So I really look at you know, these companies um, to do my due diligence. As, you know, I go in, I look for the shape of the retention curve and for what I'm looking for in that process is not necessarily what the absolute numbers are or you know what it drops off from day two to, to day three or month two to, to, to month three. It's actually seeing that flatten out at a particular point in time. Because once you see, see that flat, it tells you a couple of things. One is you can grow the company, right? Because you need old users to stay around for you know, your total uh, monthly active users to grow. Uh, that's the <laughs> obvious. But the other one, just at a deeper level, it means that you've actually got a, a relationship with the customer. There are so many businesses which have approached me and asked for, for help and said, look, you know, we, ne we need help scaling this business. And effectively, they're very transient businesses in, in terms of the relationship with the customer. They might, might acquire fundamentally all their traffic from some trick that they're doing uh, via search or uh, or all their traffic comes from Amazon, but they don't have a relationship. So people are going to buy shoes from them, but you know they don't have a relationship with that that e-tailer, uh, and so therefore there is no longer-term uh, relationship. You can't invest beyond the price of the first basket value uh, in terms of uh, setting a CPA 
uh, and therefore you can't really, really do much with them. So the retention curve and the relationship with the customer is important. The other thing I'm, I'm looking for is consistency of, of the cohorts or a lack of cohort cooling. And what that means is that for every customer that's joining in, in, in month one, when I'm looking at the second month, I want to make sure that the second month has, at the same time frame, the same level of quality as the first month. So in other words, you know, not all of the revenue is being gen generated by you know, a, a very small amount of, of users. That concentration is fine, but you want to make sure that the new users that you bring in are as the same similar quality as what they've been acquiring historically. Um, yeah, so w we, we worked on uh, Small Giant Games together a bit. So yeah. uh, Small Giant Games is a, a Helsinki-based mobile games company. Uh, EQT Ventures led the Series A in March 2017, about a year and a half ago. Uh, and we invested right before the launch of their game, uh, Empires and Puzzles. So and, and at that point, we, Angus, you joined us in, in the deal team, so to say. We, we flew into Helsinki. We did a, a deep dive in the yeah, numbers. Exactly. So he, you know, he's, a, he's a, um, a company which was lucky enough, you know, and not everyone is lucky enough to be at this stage. When they had the product, you know, and again, it was, it was still an early stage of the, of the product, but they fundamentally cracked the, their game envelope. So they had the retention number there and they had the monetization without having at that stage too much work to do before we could start the engines in terms of, of marketing. But again, that, that business showed the same characteristics in terms of the shape of the retention curve and, uh, the, and, and the yield and also the consistency of those cohorts. So, you know, w I think I joined in, in April of that year. You know, we had two or three months of data showing that, hey, what, you know, these news that are coming in love the game just as much as the previous guys did. We can verify that mathematically. Yeah, so we, we led the, the Series A there and uh, we, we invested 5 million euros on pre-22 million euros. And, and the company had uh, literally no revenues at the time we invested. And they had zero people working on marketing. What we looked for and what we found was a highly, engaging, highly engaged user base and the fact that they, after the first month, the soft launch users, they just kept playing. There was no, no a, a decrease at all in the amount of gaming sessions or how much they spent inside of the game uh, after that. And I, I can just give, we're, we're, being, we're quite transparent with numbers at EKT Ventures and I know Timo, the, the CEO, is also fine with this. So if, if you look at in September, Small Giant Games made about $18 million in revenue. So that's a year and a half later. And that's driven almost exclusively by the fact, well, obviously that they monetize now, but the fact that they made a product that the core user base loves to play and loves to come back to. So looking at the cohorts back from when we and did our DD. Awesome marketing too. Yeah, awesome marketing yeah, too. Yeah. <laughs> but lo looking at the cohorts back from April 2017, uh, the people that stuck that month are still playing at the same levels. They don't stop playing. It's like brushing your teeth. We want to build habits out of people that use consumer apps. And that's really what we look for. We're, we're happy to pay up when we find it. Um, so le let me ask you, so you know, there was a slide up here before, EQT, a multi-stage uh, company. You know, we talked a lot about, um, you know, kind of, you know, for me, I, I tend to focus on more later stage because they usually have to have the monetization, but, you know, y you focus on all the stages. So what, what do you think, you know, there must be a whole range of companies, you know, within, within the, the audience. What do you think that the founder's priority should be at each of the stages, whether it's the, you know, idea phase, the MVP, or okay. scaling growth? So at Equity Ventures, I think we, we meet about 2,500 companies per year in our wider team. I think as a first priority, I would love to see more founders going for it in the consumer space. I think a bigger trend in Europe right now is that there's a lot of B2B founders. We also back B2B founders, but I mean, pr proportionally speaking, if you look at a city like Paris, I think it's something like 85, 90% of the startups are somehow in the B2B space versus consumer. So at the top of the funnel for us, we would love to see more founders uh, going for the B2C space. Uh, secondly, I think any investor will be willing to back a company that has both engagement and monetization. If you manage to get to that point, you're in the golden land. So where do we play a, a role here? We are the firm, we're happy to make a bet 
if you have engagement only and want to continue working on that for another 6, 12, 18 months, really perfecting uh, the engagement of your user base before you're being pushed by your investors to go and monetize. That's wha what we can do with a larger fund like uh, our 566 million multi-stage fund. We can signal that it's fine for us to invest three or four or five million early stage without seeing any revenue and wi without seeing a need for revenue in the next uh, short f uh, future. And instead focusing on building for the long-term global winning scenario. And I think that's where U.S. investors historically have been much better than European investors. And that's where you see a lot of the consumer, the global winners within the consumer startup space coming from the West Coast in the U.S. or New York, where you have lo other large investors making these sort of bets and being patients, patient with, with uh, the focus on profitability or monetization. So we want to be that sort of uh, high-risk appetite investor back in the most ambitious entrepreneurs uh, in Europe and Paris, of course. And, and uh, okay, so but, but back, back to you and, and, and your uh, expertise, uh, I guess. So uh, assuming you have uh, the engagement in your app, uh, what are the next steps uh, as, as you see it? And, and is there a way where you can do performance marketing even if you don't have a a monetizing product. Is there a way you can test that out? Okay, yeah. Okay, let's let's break that down into two parts. Let's first of all just on the on the marketing. For, for I'm going to be here after this, um, and I've got lots of opinions on marketing. So please come and ask me because I'm not going to be able to say everything I know about marketing in in, in three minutes time. But I'm just going to go through just on the on the on the the marketing front, um, kind of what my golden rules are uh, and, and, and what I what I look for. Um, you know, when you all of a sudden you you okay, you got a product, it's got monetization or whatnot. What are your next steps? Well, you you, you got to get a team together, right? Someone's actually got to do it. Good marketers are hard to find, right? Um, you know, particularly in this space, what I'm what I'm looking for is you know I, I want people with uh, you know, largely from a digital background because I think it's easier to, to come from a digital space and a performance marketing space in particular, focus on ROI and learn all the other stuff, and brand and all the, than the other way around. Um, um, assembling that, that team, that team is hard, but it's important to, to, to get right. The, 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 the next thing, um, the next thing is what's important, the difference between, you know, like normal marketers and great marketers is their ability to focus on, um, customers and, and their CPA. So if I look at my time at King or what I did at King or what I did at Small Giant Games or any other client, um, 80% of my time is understanding the unit economics of the business and what I can afford to pay for customers on a very, very granular level. If you're dealing in averages, if you're working out this is my CPA target or you know, this is, we can, this is the CAC we can afford, and you've got one figure as an average, it means you're an average business, okay? There is not a single, you know, uh, uh, CPA target you should have. You should be have a, a set, you know, you should know all the segments of your audience, and you should all price them uh, accordingly so you can make the returns on investment uh, for each of them. So 80% of my time was coming up with a justification for that CPA target, and usually that consists of uh, what I call the single user value. That's the stuff you can see, right? That's the stuff in your database. So you've got a user ID, user ID, it's got a whole bunch of revenue associated with that, you've got an LTV for that user. Now, if you're only um, paying that amount of LTV, you're severely, for in most businesses, under undervaluing the, 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 the dollars that you're putting into marketing because there are usually other upside you get from spending that dollar on marketing. So you acquire one user, one, one, one other way you're making money is, is through virality, right? And virality can be uh, organic, classic, what we call word of mouth, buzz if you will, where you're acquiring, you acquire one user, that person shows, gets another user, brings them in for free. Um, another, another way it would be, you know, managing to cross-sell or upsell that user into other products and services and having additional revenue streams. But what you should be able to do is have a good understanding that when we put a user in, these things are going to happen. This revenue is, is going to happen. 
and track that back and make an attempt to track that back to an individual user. Uh, very important, and I spend m most so of my so time. As you can hear, you'll need a lot of data people for this, da right? Data so people, for, yep. for every Angus you find, you need at least one data person <laughs> to make sure you can support the, those. Uh, and, and that's the, the next point I had, you know, tracking and analytics needs to be spot on, right? You need, you need some absolute wonders and stars in the company that know, wha know what they're doing. Um, then in terms of the deployment, a lot of people can do to Google campaigns, a lot of people can do Facebook campaigns. You just gotta make sure you find the ones that are gonna be disciplined in making sure that they're hitting the CPA targets which you've assigned them with. And they have the curiosity to test, learn and refine that they're creating structured tests. You know, a lot of people come to me and say, hey, Angus, we, we tested Facebook, you know, and it didn't work. Well, how, 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 how did it not work? And then, it, well, it didn't hit our CPA. Well, what did you do? Well, we spent five grand, it didn't work. You know, they, they weren't able to really delve beneath the surface to work out, you know, exactly what were the constituent components of, of, of this that, that actually failed and how can we continue to prove. If a, if a channel, as broad as Facebook doesn't work for your business, you probably got some serious problems with your business model because it effectively means that you're not able to convince any one of one billion people that your product is actually worth installing. Um, so, so, so there's that you know structured approach to, to, to testing. What's the last point? Yeah, and enfor enforcing of, of the rules. But look, we could go on for the deployment side for ages. If you've got questions, you know I'm, I'm about so come up and have a chat. Yes, yeah, so maybe, maybe we'll stop there and hand over to, uh, to questions. But uh, one more uh, thing, you know, so, so Bartos and our team uh, based here in Paris full time. Uh, so if you want to reach out to us, I think he's a great person to, uh, to meet up with. And then I'm here uh, probably every five or six weeks uh, minimum. Uh, I would love to meet a lot of you guys. I'm going to be here after this uh, talk, uh, hang out a little bit uh, over by the bar if there's one. Uh, but but uh, for now, we'll hand over to questions. Thank you. So, yeah, so if you have a question, I can give you the mic. Yeah. All right. Hi, uh, Marshall from uh, Hobby We're a mobile gaming company as well. Um, my question was about to, uh, what do you consider a uh, healthy mix between performance marketing uh, community influencers and brand marketing. Uh, we know for a fact that you know at some point performance marketing is you know get you get marginal returns and uh, diminishing returns and you need to uh, diversify your your marketing uh, opportunities. And I wanted to uh, to know what was your your take on that. You want? I'll take this one. Um, so so look, obviously I come from a very big performance marketing background. Um, but I'm not religious about it. I do whatever works, but what I am is data-driven. Um, usually things which are not performance marketing aren't subjected to the same level of rigor and analysis that performance marketing is. So, you know, you get a lot of gaming companies, particularly when they have a low baseline, that then go and have an influencer, and they say, well, you know, influencers work for us. But then there's, you know, and we, you, there's case studies where they, they'll put it on a slide and say, hey, well, that's wonderful. But you never see, okay, this is how much it costs us, either in terms of paying the influencer, coming up with a campaign, um, coming up with, with, with you know, and, uh, and they never factor in how much time it actually takes out to coordinate these, what I call ad hoc activities that aren't scalable and repeatable. Um, so... Obviously, my preference is to find something. It's very easy to just have a campaign and leave it running and optimize that and potentially do other things than work on a campaign for uh, 10 months. I've got a story. No. Yeah, go, go. All right, so, so basically, let me give you an example, right? Um, there's an infamous story about hot air balloons. You know this one? So um, at the height of Candy Crush, uh, we said, look, we gotta, we got to do something amazing for the, candy, the new Candy Crush launch, which has come out. And we're trying to think big and literally blue sky. And we ordered three hot air balloons with full screen, high definition videos that stretched all around at a price of eight million pound, right? Now, 
turns out that those, video, those balloons didn't end up flying. They needed to be tethered to the ground because I didn't think that the power, they needed power, right? <laughs> so <laughs> the batteries were too heavy for them to fly. But the story, the story is, is this, and this was the lesson learned for me, which was we spent 80% of our time and our thought process on these fucking balloons when we were just about to launch the largest video game, you know, uh, history, in history of the launch. I mean, it was the fastest... You know, installing game at, at the time, and we were spending eighty percent of that rather than getting the basics right. You know, I had already let it, left King at that yeah, point. Yeah. Just want to point that out. I was not there when this. <laughs> he wouldn't have approved. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, d d that and that rams home the point. So, what's the healthy mix? The healthy mix is whatever, what it, whatever works for you on an ongoing basis. In my experience, I've just found that like it's much easier to fix your monetization, your retention, to sustain an ongoing performance marketing campaign, and the business will grow. And that's my, my experience at King, Small Giant, and uh, a few other companies. So, Yeah, th so I think from an investor point of view, I think we'd like to see as much as possible of both. It should not be an either or, or at one at the expense of the other. But, but to repeat uh, uh, Angus's point, it needs to be scalable and repeatable. So if you find one influencer and that's going to be great for your product, then from an investor point of view, the, the follow-up question is, what well, can you find a thousand people like this influencer and repeat that on a global basis? And if the answer is no, then it's, it's not as helpful for the future of your company as it is today. Performance marketing, I, I think uh, what we like to see is having a, a mindset that you can always be, it's like a gold digger mindset, but not the gold digger in a negative sense, but the actual gold digger, uh, you know, the, and the gold rush in the California days. You know, someone who is willing to spend time and energy and trying to find pockets of users that you can acquire at a certain CPI, CPA. That's going to change over time who they are and how much you can buy at certain levels. But you need to have that sort of always iterating, always finding, looking for new ways of scaling that performance marketing channel. And I think at some points in the mobile mar marketing, uh, mobile gaming company's history, you will have one-to-one -one ratios. Sometimes you'll have three-to-one performance marketing. and sometimes three to one uh, community influencer viral marketing. But uh, overall, you know, s spend your time and energy on where you think you can find the next big pocket of users and repeat that over and over again. Any other questions? Hi, Pascal. Um, I was wondering, so when you start your business, so which are like the key indicators regarding the marketing part which you would look at? And as you advance in the maturity of your business, like how do they change, if they change? Right. So I think we covered this a little bit just in terms of what I'm looking for uh, in particular is the, the flatness of that retention curve. Um, we, you yeah. know, it's really important that the users are sticking around and you can see that visibly and they've got a high level of, you know, I guess you need the data sufficiency there to, so it's not just one or two users that you've, you've scaled a little bit and you've got reliability in that data set that, that that's going to continue to happen and all you need to do is pour users into the top of the funnel. I mean, that's the, the biggest indicator. Yeah, so I, ideally, from our perspective, you would have, you know, 1,000 to 10,000 users tracking towards a one-year retention of 5%. And obviously, that's a long time in the future if you're an early-stage company. You can't wait for a year's worth of data you don't have that luxury <laughs> in many cases. So what you can find is proxy uh, data points that tells you if you're on track or off track to get there. So in my experience, if to get to 5% day 365 uh, retention, you probably need to be around 12, 13% on day 30. And to be on 12, 13% on day 30, assuming a normal shortfall, you probably need to be uh, close to 50% on second day. So if you have 100 people installed today, probably 50 of them needs to come back tomorrow. If you're at 20, you're going to be very far away from that 5% uh, one-year retention. So you also notice that we're talking about daily cohorts. Uh, and if you're a B2C company, you really need to be doing it at that level of granularity. Otherwise, you can't manage the business on a day-to-day -day because you can't see which sections of the funnel that people are actually falling out of. And you don't know whether you know, it's an action that you made in the last product update or sprint that's affected that funnel or not because it's obscured by the aggregation of effectively a lot of daily 
early cohorts. Yes, we're, we, we sometimes say in our team that we're, we're cohort investors, not top line investors. So that's the, the key, key thing again, is the engagement of your user base and retention. If you're not thinking in cohorts, don't even bother. I mean, this is so fundamental to a B2C business. You need to understand it inside out. Absolutely. Hello. Uh, hello, everyone. So I was wondering between uh, the two factors, between uh, the, the fact that you have to create a community that uh, have the habits to use your service, and uh, the fact that um, you, might, you may have revenue or not, uh, what is uh, most uh, reassuring for you guys to between a startup that uh, has already built a, co um, a community using the service but uh, that doesn't pay for it, or between with um, uh, a startup that uh, makes revenues but uh, not only them, with the users that don't use the service on a daily basis? So uh, for, for me, uh, personally, I would, so I, I would rank it, you know, if you have both engagement and monetization, you're in the promised land and any investor will throw money at you. Second priority for me would be to have engagement but not monetization. Because I think the third option to have monetization but not long-term engagement is not as healthy for your business long-term. You'll be much more transactional and then you'll run out of users to that use your app mm. or service. So that would be my priority mm. list. And if you've got, if you've got, you, you've got the engagement and you've got a clear plan about how you're going to turn those daily active or monthly active users into revenue, then that's even better. If this is a clear, you know, if you're joining the dots for a potential investor, hey, you know, they're here. It, one, of, one of my clients uh, has a, a current account. Uh, it's sort of a, a new, new age fintech company and they don't have any logical revenue streams on a current account, but they're going to have instant loans via the application. You know, that makes absolute sense, and it's very easy to join the dots between the amount of users you have and the amount of revenue that you could you could potentially make. So having that clear plan about how you're going to do that, and and some assumptions around, you know, we're going to convert X percent because you can't just say everyone's going to pay, right? And 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 if you could back that up with some form of, you know, it doesn't need to be actual, but you know, some sort of survey or something else, and you know, could be good. No, I'm just making this up now. <laughs> Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you for, for coming, and we hope to see you again soon.